Um, first, I wanted to thank, of course, the communication design department, specifically Irun and Brendan Griffiths, also Kelly Waters. Thanks for moderating. Um, and then I also wanted to thank two of my collaborators, Rahul Shinde, and then also Khalil Capuzo, both of whom, with which out, I don't think I could have really done this presentation. Um, so authenticity. I'm going to be honest, I don't think I can really provide a specific definition of authenticity, um, but I think this presentation can maybe outline kind of a web of thoughts that I have kind of in reaction to an ambient culture that seems to value authenticity and how that might relate to kind of my personal practice. Hopefully there's something useful in kind of the footnotes. Um, there's an arena channel that I've compiled um, that I'll kind of have a link to at the end. I'm going to start relatively broadly and suggest that authenticity is something that we often use to kind of leverage capital. Um, it's something that categorizes the authentic, the non-authentic, and it's often kind of bestowed uh, to validate kind of a sense of power. Um, a good example that I have maybe is um, authenticity is something that's sought after in the tourism industry. They're kind of global interfaces like Airbnb that really rely on us wanting an authentic experience. Um, the Airbnb network as a whole is quite image heavy if you kind of browse it. Um, and this kind of produces a sense in which there's a slow dilution where all of us, I think, can kind of recognize what might be looking authentic, what might not be looking authentic. Another way to maybe approach this um, is kind of with the colloquialism ruin chic. So I think all of us might implicitly kind of know what this points towards cafes with exposed raw wood. Um, maybe some exposed brick. Um, but this isn't necessarily a new concept. Um, kind of a writer, Laura Persglove, um, writes for The New Inquiry that this kind of aesthetic of authenticity isn't something um, completely new. It's something that the British and German romantics in the 19th century kind of were heavily inspired by in archaeological digs in Greece and Italy to kind of build fake ruins, follies, as they're called. They're kind of visual techniques that are employed um, to kind of give a semblance of authenticity, this kind of feeling of, of real. Even kind of the image that I have behind me of the Acropolis is something which at least I've kind of grown up as always being pointed towards as this cornerstone of our democracy. Um, it's something that's like persistent, right? Um, but if we kind of look at it closer, it's constantly as a ruin under construction, kind of maintain a particular image. Um, and so again, we kind of have something that might be kind of initially at a glance persistent, um, but is really kind of a narrative device. It's something that's used to kind of claim some sort of power. So my first impulse here is to say authenticity doesn't exist, something about simulacra, um, but I don't think that that's kind of right, because I think that there is kind of perhaps a gut reaction that we feel when we hear the word authentic. Um, and I think that this is kind of valuable. Authenticity is something that's kind of given um, as a category, and it's given by an audience, right? Um, and in order to maintain that kind of authenticity, we have to kind of build or kind of maintain projects. Um, the kind of phrase I have in my mind is this the fact that I can't say that I'm authentic, but you all could say that I'm authentic, right? Um, and I think that this is something that's kind of exciting or hopeful. It means that while we might be constantly projecting signifiers that are authentic outwards, um, we can't assume its persistence. I can't assume that you all think I'm authentic today, but maybe not tomorrow, right? So there's kind of a sense in which we're constantly maintaining, we're constantly building, um, or in the context of this, right, we're constantly designing. And so the goal in my mind then is to acknowledge that there is building involved, and we want to maybe take a look at who's involved in that building. So I think I exist in this kind of funny category where I don't necessarily affiliate myself with any studio in specific. Um, I'm often described as kind of an independent designer, but I think this is kind of a misnomer. I think I'm more of a dependent designer. Um, and that's like, yeah, I mean, 
I'm dependent on a lot of things, right? So kind of on the left are maybe kind of a couple of small studios that I've had the pleasure of working with. Um, and these are kind of personal ties that I depend on. Um, on the right, um, just to draw into focus, they're kind of these like larger, almost like mega structures that I have a little bit more of an algorithmic relationship to, right? And especially this group here, right? Um, is not that different when it comes um, or changes from person to person. Um, it's kind of a space that a lot of us inhabit, right? Working with Adobe, maybe AWS, Apple, Dropbox, even Facebook or YouTube, right? Great tutorials on YouTube. Um, there's kind of a sense, though, that these kind of facilitate a space that still feels unique, right? This is kind of part of their strategy. There's kind of words like creativity that's thrown around. There's kind of the idea of custom, right? Um, and I, of course, have plenty of critiques that I could rant about all the time of, with these. Um, but I think they facilitate kind of a ground layer of commonality, right? They're professional signifiers. Um, and kind of the power here is that we get to all collectively build on top of them. And so then if we focus on this second group, right? Um, this is kind of where the word relationship kind of comes up in my mind a little bit more. There's a little bit more maintenance here that's required. Um, it's a little bit more nuanced maybe than subscription fees or accounts. Um, of course, there is still capital involved. It's a type of livelihood. Um, but I think tangentially, there's this maintenance of relationships that really revolves around encountering and processing material. There's kind of a for that's implied, often working for clients, but there's a with that I think is infinitely more valuable here. And so kind of in that context, I'd like to look at kind of a couple of examples um, that I've been able to kind of have a lot of exposure to over the past um, couple of semesters. So the first one um, is this short publication called A Typographic Discourse, The Distaff Side of Printing, a book for ladies. This was produced in 1937 um, by J. Brampporn. Um, and it's kind of, I mean, 1937, I think, is, is kind of a space in which, at least reading through this book, um, the world of typography was, was dominated by men, right? And so we have, and if we look at this a little bit, I'm going to turn because I want to read some of this out loud. Um, we have this introduction, Matt abandoned, the jumbo presses are revolutionizing the printing world, turning it upside down and topsy-turvy, exposing all its hoodoo voodoo and divesting its weird ceremonies of all their glamour. Jumbo stripped the mask from typography's medicine men, and their disciples have seen them as they were, pompous, tottering pretenders. Um, there's immediately kind of a sense of deconstruction here, right? It's kind of pointing out um, that we do kind of value perhaps um, certain aspects of this. There's a certain level of craft that obviously persists in this publication. Um, but simultaneously, there's kind of a sense in which there's a poking at kind of perhaps um, the kind of coalescing of craft and language here, right? Um, so if we look at this a little bit more, um, kind of tenant number two, if we skip a little bit, um, we can look at um, kind of here where it writes, name the types and to be able to recognize them at a glance, and it may be great satisfaction to know the mathematics and theory of type sizes. But there is folly to waste much time on this. What goes with Garamond? Anything and everything. Bodoni? Well, that's different. Throw it out of the window. Um, and kind of going on and listing these typefaces, and kind of if we jump to the next page, um, we kind of begin to look that there's kind of a sense where um, towards kind of the bottom here. Also, this marvelous male periodically corners Jumbo, who's the author, and rattles off a terrifying group of figures evidently designed to demonstrate with what ease a person, providing he has inside information, can use certain type sizes or spaces, right? And that these will kind of fit. In contrast, something like that for Jumbo's part roots around until she finds something she wants. So I think here we again kind of see the separation between craft and language. Specifically, language implies a network, right? It implies this kind of notion if you have inside information. In contrast, though, there's kind of a polling perhaps here um, 
and kind of saying, you know what, you don't need this language in particular to be able to figure this out. You can kind of play around and you can kind of pull what you need to produce, quite frankly, a beautiful little pamphlet, um, something that kind of speaks towards a high level of craft without listening to kind of rules that perhaps previously existed. Um, there's kind of a sense in which this publication itself um, implies living proof of kind of what um, uh, Jumbo, I guess, um, kind of is trying to push forward, which is that you don't need this perhaps language around things um, to reinforce a craft that already exists. You can kind of pull what you want. So there's a sense of perhaps redefining, right? Saying, I want to take this and pull it perhaps from the ruins, from this kind of Acropolis, right? Um, and kind of build on top of it. Bruno Latour, to jump a little bit, is a sociologist and anthropologist. He has this kind of, he writes a lot about designing and redesigning, but this particular quote, I think, is something that I feel exists in the context of authenticity quite nicely. When you talk about designing or redesigning, it means you have abandoned revolution and tabula rasa, and that the best you can expect is to make life more livable. It is slightly more ambitious than remediation, but is less heroic than revolution. Adapting, adjusting, coping, all sorts of words that it means to live in the ruins. This, I think, kind of points towards the previous slides we were looking at in kind of a, a nice way, in the sense that the distaff side of printing, the kind of publication we were looking at, was really pulling out of the ruins. It was pulling kind of qualities, perhaps, that were valuable, this kind of level of craft, right? But leaving perhaps some of the language that was quite frankly hindering, right? Um, and so in the context of this quote, it means that we can kind of develop a foundation, um, right? And that that's an optimistic space. It means that we have something to work with. We have a problem to solve. And kind of in some ways, this is, um, you know, something about maintaining categories. It's kind of even a maintenance, again, kind of a redesigning, a rebuilding. There's kind of something that almost needs to be fixed. An example that strikes me as kind of exciting in this context is the work by the American architect, Libias Woods. Um, I first encountered him in the MoMA. Um, there was kind of an exhibit recently called Towards a Concrete Utopia, Architecture in Yugoslavia. Um, and there's kind of this grappling with this notion of ruins um, that I think is, is quite exciting in this context again. Um, it's kind of a building on top of, it's, it's kind of paying homage perhaps in some ways, it's revealing kind of the structures underneath, but saying that these are things that we can perhaps use as our foundation, but build on top of. Um, there's an acknowledgement, but simultaneously there's literally something that's expanding into the new. Perhaps a more networked example um, is Jane Fulton Suri, um, who published um, kind of under IDO, um, a book called Thoughtless Acts, which is something that kind of is, again, pretty exciting to me because it outlines this idea of interacting with kind of a built environment in new and perhaps a little bit novel ways. Um, there's kind of a sense of, again, building from, right, whether it's a revolving door that suddenly works um, as kind of a playground, or um, perhaps is a collection of, you know, teacups to mark the empty kind of coffee container, um, whether it's kind of a makeshift chair or using a Pepsi can as kind of um, something to cool you, and perhaps um, not the traditional way um, to kind of, on a, on a hot day. There's kind of a sense in which we're using kind of the context that we're in, or even the network that we're in, and kind of building on top. We're interfacing with these objects. We're creating interactions that perhaps aren't necessarily kind of um, as guided or as prefaced. This past semester, I got to teach um, a class with Khalil called Network Interfacing. Um, and kind of a funny title, but we kind of operated from the preface that networks are a series of relationships. Interfaces there 
are kind of moments perhaps where these networks encounter one another. They're kind of momentary encounters. Um, they're instances, they're renderings. Um, and they really kind of influence, that is, networks and their interfaces do, um, how we engage with the world around us. Um, to kind of go back, right, kids playing on rotating doors implies kind of a whole infrastructure or network of decisions. Or even Airbnb's interface visualizes instances in a network that guide us when we're traveling and what we feel like traveling should be like. And so we wanted to facilitate a space that it could explore perhaps these networks and interfaces um, in a little bit of a sandboxed way with an emphasis on building. Um, some of you may be familiar with the Beaker browser and the DAT protocol, um, but just to kind of sum it up quickly, this is a peer-to-peer -peer browser, um, which means that maybe the next one's kind of like a better visualization. Rather than engaging with a website with some sort of centralized source, a server kind of view a website, um, the engagement is a little bit more direct. I can put files onto my browser that someone else can immediately view. Um, and there's kind of a relationship that happens there that kind of facilitates a really pleasant space in the classroom um, for a couple of reasons. One, it's lightweight, just requires kind of knowledge of JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. It also allows us to er easily learn from one another. It simplifies the uploading and downloading or viewing of websites. And it also acts as a nice learning experience. Quite frankly, the Beaker browser is a work in progress. It's being built, it's messy. And it requires engagement with others that's not purely digitized. Throughout the class, there's kind of a lot of, or was a lot of conversation and troubleshooting. And I think that this thing, or this can kind of be seen as an asset. It requires maintenance. So this small scale social network that we built kind of uses this distributed model and forces you to engage with people directly. To facilitate that, we really only had two larger projects over the course of the semester. The first one was that we had to kind of have each student build an interface for this network. Um, and then we also wanted to build a feature for this network. And I'll get into kind of what that means um, shortly. So in contrast, maybe to Instagram or Facebook or so forth, um, we had fairly minimal kind of baseline requirements. Everyone was given a profile, which consisted of a username and a bio, and there was a post type. You know, there was a title, a timestamp, um, and then the contents of the posts. Um, so if we kind of briefly go back to the feature, right, the feature was kind of an add-in or a plug-in that others can incorporate in their interfaces. So things like like buttons or comments um, or anything kind of else that we wanted to build on top of these posts were things that people would have to kind of design and program, and then program in such a way that others could perhaps install them on their own. So again, there's kind of this maintenance that happens over the course of the semester. There's this emphasis on kind of the personal and the networked, and you have to kind of engage with the posts of others. You have to build your feature well enough so that others can implement it. Um, and this kind of exposes an opportunity for building but more specifically, how to build on top of existing material. And in a way, how to build on that material so that it might influence it. Um, there's kind of, a, in my mind, a sense of acknowledgement that's inherent to this. Um, the peer-to-peer -peer network means that you're certainly, um, or sorry, that means there are certain structural things that everyone has to agree upon. You have to agree upon a basic post type. Um, and in order to agree on that, you often kind of have to have a meta network. Um, kind of in real life discussions. I wanted to showcase a few of the projects that kind of came out of this pro um, class. Uh, the first one is by a student, Geddes, um, whose interface um, kind of acted as perhaps a showcase um, for his feature. His feature kind of being difficult to see on the screen, maybe in the bottom, um, left a little bit more clearly, was kind of a slider that each um, kind of post had to be engaged with. So the idea that something's difficult to read upon first glance and in order to engage with this post, which is kind of acting as a feed of upcoming posts, right? Um, you had to brighten it to see it and then you were able to kind of recategorize it 
um, through kind of like decreasing opacity was something that was kind of exciting. It meant that you had to confront each post and decide if you even wanted to engage with it and then kind of categorize it maybe into more brighter or more legible contexts if you want to keep it or darker contexts if you wanted to perhaps kind of hide it or not necessarily acknowledge it. This kind of came from um, kind of a calling out of, of the difficulty of flagging posts, right? And so perhaps a gradation is something that implies a little bit more of kind of a nuanced way of discussing um, kind of posts. There's a sense in which, um, you know, if something's completely hidden, perhaps it's flagged, but if something's maybe at 20%, it means that you're just not quite interested in that post type. Another example I wanted to bring up was uh, from a student, Shiv, who opted for maybe a draggable interface, um, kind of even with a grid layout. And the interesting thing here was his post types or his feature um, was kind of really to give different media types, um, kind of different visual identifications. So having audio perhaps be orange, um, images full screen, um, and then kind of text with kind of uh, strong purplish blue. What's interesting about this feature is that he inadvertently was able to produce um, some sort of visual metric for what kind of posts were being used on this network. Um, and more specifically, or kind of ironically, using this feature meant that you could very quickly see who wasn't using this feature. Um, so if we look in the bottom corner, um, there's a user who only has text posts, which means that although this feature kind of adopts a format, um, there's a sense in which it immediately is telling you that these are post types that are not structured in a way to kind of accept his features structuring. So there's kind of a metric that inadvertently happens, kind of a way in which you can very quickly judge other users and kind of the, the type of posts that they're producing in relation to your own. Another example um, is from a student, Caroline, whose implementation or feature was kind of a very simple um, feature. It was kind of that of a clock, um, but a clock that allowed you to kind of very easily implement it in a wide variety of ways. Not only was she able to kind of build some scripts in that allowed you to kind of control how your clock or kind of feature influences your interface over time, um, but there's also a sense in which this feature was highly customizable and was kind of implemented very quickly by quite a few students in order to kind of identify um, or kind of allow for almost like a, a timeline of an inner. And then finally, I'd like to look at Simon's um, project, which was kind of these avatars that you could kind of download and were hosted on an external service um, that essentially allowed for incentivized posting. So this idea of unlocking particular avatars and having access to particular avatars as a way to incentivize network use. The more you posted, the more options you had to choose from. Um, of course, if we kind of look at the context of maybe this, net, um, this particular kind of um, interface, it produces a way in which um, Simon's work actually had to produce a lot of empty posts to be able to, be able to even test kind of network. So there's kind of this um, interesting instance where we have kind of moments of a feature or an individual feature dramatically influencing kind of how other students receive kind of the work. I'd like to then conclude by kind of pointing towards um, this quote by Anna Lovenhaupt Singh um, from her book, The Mushroom at the End of the World. And I'd like to just kind of briefly look at the word category in the context of interface um, and kind of point towards or read it with that. If interfaces are unstable, we must watch them emerge within encounters. To use an interface um, means a commitment to tracing the assemblages in which these interfaces gain momentary hold. Interfaces are in flux. They're kind of instances of a network. And so kind of thinking about what it means to build that network slowly but surely is kind of a way in which perhaps we can engage a little bit more closely with those encounters. Thanks.